proud of poverty of almost any major country on earth. But if you love the, the, the children, you gotta love the educators. And that means making it easier for people of all incomes to get the degrees that they need, whether it's a college degree or a graduate degree. And the second thing we do is to say that if you are gonna go into the teaching profession, we are gonna make sure that teachers get <clears throat> the respect and the acknowledgement that they deserve. And that means that we say to the young people, teaching is an enormously important profession. It is. You are doing, and thank you for what you're doing, you're doing some of the most important work that can be done in America. And if we can play basketball, if this country can pay basketball players and football players tens of millions of dollars a year, you know what, we can pay every teacher in this country at least $60,000 a year for doing the important work. And the third point, the third point is that is part of our education proposal, we cancel all student debt in this country. So right now, what we are seeing is that in many school districts, teachers are leaving, all right, because they're not making some of the best teachers. They're not making the income that they need. They're paying off their student debt. Sometimes they have to take money out of their own pockets to buy school supplies, and maybe they're working two or three jobs. That is insane. That is not what you do in a country that looks to the future and wants to have the best educated population on earth. So we make public colleges and universities tuition free. We make it possible for everybody, and I know this is a radical idea, but this is what we've got to do. Make it possible for anybody in America who wants to go to college, has the ability to be able to do so. We cancel all student debt, and we put a whole lot of money into making sure, by the way, that our Title I schools get the funding they need. We triple funding the Title I schools. We put a lot of money into making sure teachers are now seeing more and more kids with various types of disabilities. We put a lot of money into helping staff up those school rooms so that those children with disabilities can get the attention that they deserve. But thank you very much for being here. I'm glad you brought up the point about black doctors as well, because it's not only that black people feel more comfortable with black doctors, but we know for many black people it's about life and death, as many ailments are not even believed by the doctors. That's um, exactly what I'm about. talking about. And i got to tell you something, to be honest with you. I did not fully appreciate this. You know, we're fighting for Medicare for all and, and all that, and we can talk about it or not. But I was in a room with some young people from Howard University a few months ago. And we're talking about this. And one young woman said, you know what? My mother really is very reluctant to go to the doctor because she believes that the doctor, she feels that the doctor doesn't believe her. I mean, your point is well taken. And I was surprised that that's so, um, so widely felt. Next up, we have Kimberly Arellano Cruz, a member of Arriba Las Vegas Workers Center, a community organization at the forefront of defending undocumented workers. Kimberly? Senator, I'm going to stick right. My name is Kimberly Arellano. I was born in California, but I'm raised in Las Vegas. My parents came to the U.S. looking for better opportunities. But my mom, Isabel Arellano, has been facing deportation. It all started when the Las Vegas office pulled her over over a traffic ticket, then turned her over into ICE. Here in Las Vegas, the new department participated in the government programs like 287D that are encouraged them to take to turn people people over like my mom for deportation. Will you repeal the 287 d as a president, president and how will you separate local law enforcement as a The short answer is yes, I will. The longer answer is that we will end the terror terrorization that now goes on in communities all over this country through ICE raids. We're gonna end those. And we are gonna move. I was in um, California, in Los Angeles, and like uh, Las Vegas, the public school system in, in Los Angeles is largely uh, children of color. 
And I was talking to some of the teachers there. And they were saying, and it makes perfect sense to me, that many of the children who are in the schools are basically traumatized. They're dealing with trauma right now, worrying that when they go home from school, maybe their mom or their dad will have been arrested. That is unacceptable. We cannot have millions of people and children living in that type of fear. So we will end that program. There's enough for local police to be doing to protect people. They don't have to be working with federal agencies uh, on immigration issues. Uh, and obviously, it goes without saying that we are going to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path towards citizenship for 11 million people in this country who are currently undocumented. We are going to, on day one, through an executive order, restore the legal status of the 1.8 million young people in the DACA program. We do that on day one. And we can talk about this more later, but we will also establish, will establish a humane asylum process at the border and not have federal agents killing <laughs> children from the arms of their mother. Right? And I, I want to say this is not just my idea. This is a concept which is supported by a majority of the American people. And I want everybody in this room to know, I know you've been experiencing a lot of pain and ugliness coming from the White House, but do not believe for one second that Trump is speaking for the American people. The American people believe in comprehensive immigration reform. The American people understand that our economy would be destroyed if suddenly millions of people were thrown out of this country. People today, maybe you're dead, who is doing some of the hardest, lowest paid work in America. So we are going to turn that around, and uh, we are going to end that program. Senator, and now let's turn to an issue that is not very much discussed, Puerto Rico, but is very important to me as someone who was born there. Much of the national conversation around Puerto Rico has focused on hurricanes Irma and Maria, but what we'd like to focus on is two things. First, PROMESA, the bill that Congress yep. passed that instituted a federal fiscal control board of yep. seven unelected people to govern Puerto Rico, and two, the 72 plus billion dollar debt. We'd like to know what led you to vote against PROMESA and the Fiscal Control Board, and are you prepared to build on that by fully canceling Puerto Rico's debt? Thank you. I mean, that is an issue that does not get discussed enough. You're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of attention, rightfully so, has been placed on Puerto Rico in terms of the terrible the, the storms that they experienced and the damage done in those storms. I am proud to say that uh, Carmen Yelene Cruz, who you know is the mayor of San Juan, is a co-chair of uh, my uh, campaign. And Carmen and I have worked together on a number of issues regarding uh, Puerto Rico, above and beyond the damage done to the storms. You know that Puerto Rico has been suffering a major depression, a depression for many, many years before the storm. They're seeing a brain drain of young people leaving the island because there are not jobs there that can pay people a living wage. Poverty level, extraordinary, extraordinarily high. And in the midst of all of this economic misery, where schools are being shut down, where at the University of San Juan, tuition is going way up, which will make it harder for young people to go to college uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, in the midst of all of that, what was established some years ago against my very, it's not just that I voted against that, I was leading the opposition to it. And what Congress decided to do is basically, you know, we can argue about the politics of Puerto Rico, which are pretty complicated. And people there have different opinions as to where they want the island to go. But what Congress did is essentially strip 
Puerto Rico of almost any semblance of democracy by establishing, as you indicated, what they call a control board. Some call it a junta. Exactly. All right? And what this junta is about is essentially telling the legislature them, uh, writing the budgets and cutting back on workers' pensions, cutting back on education, cutting back on health care, uh, and basically stripping the people of Puerto Rico from democratic representation. So issue number one, I helped lead the effort against that because I knew, I knew exactly what would happen. Uh, and I happen to believe, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I believe in democracy. <laughs> that we elect leaders, you don't like them, throw them out, but this is a board that is uncontrollable. They are separate from the people of Puerto Rico. They do whatever they want to do, and no one can control them. That is so wrong. Second of all, you raise the issue of the massive debt that Puerto Rico is holding and cannot pay. Cannot pay. Now, what that is about is a whole other story. And that is about these uh, hedge funds in Wall Street who, in a disgusting way, are buying bonds, uh, Puerto Rican bonds, at very low rates, uh, and then wanting 100% payback uh, on the dollar. So Puerto Rico has a debt, and what's it, 79 billion? 72 plus. 72 plus billion. And you've got an island that is in incredibly poor. It cannot pay back. That did. That's a simple fact. You cannot. So if your question is, do I think we should forgive that debt? Yes, I do. And just to make sure, by forgiving, you mean fully canceling the debt? Yes. Okay. No, I've said that before, and I'm happy to repeat it again. All right. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so now let's turn to gender and criminal justice. As you know, the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. From what we've seen in the media, you have said that you signed the controversial 1994 crime bill. I signed it, I voted. Entitled, yes, voted for it. Yeah. Entitled the Violent Crime Controlled and Law Enforcement Act as a compromise that included, in part, approving the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA. We also know this bill has contributed to mass incarceration, especially felt by communities of color, and in terms of VAWA, those resources put into punitive legal systems. One of the most alarming current trends is that women are the highest growing population in prison, particularly black women, including black Latina women. Do you think the 1994 crime bill should be repealed? And what is the role of the federal government to reduce the harm, particularly as it relates to the growing trend of women in prison? I did vote for the bill. I voted for the bill because I made a promise to the people of my own state. And the promise that I made is I would vote to end the sale and distribution of assault weapons in this country. And that was in that bill. So I made a promise to the people in my own state. And the second thing was that there was a good piece of legislation, the Violence Against Women Act. And that was in it as well. But, what you didn't mention, is during that debate, I was on the floor of the House. I was in the House of the Senate. And I made it very, very clear I knew what the potential harm that that bill could be, could be in terms of mass incarceration, in terms of capital punishment. So sometimes when you are in Congress and you have a very big bill in front of you, and that bill contains things that are good, banning assault weapons was what I believed to be right. It was a promise that I made to the people in my state. Violence Against Women's Act was right. Many bad things that were in that bill. And I made it clear. So I didn't write that bill. Sometimes in Congress you're forced to vote on a bill, you know, you're torn one way or the other. But to answer your question, it is clear that that bill, because of a number of terrible provisions in it, three strikes and you're out and so forth, has led to mass incarceration uh, and most, and impacting mostly uh, people of color, uh, the African American community, Latino community, Native American community as well. You rightly pointed out that in our country, we have more people in jail than any other country on earth. Just think about it. Over two million people in jail 
that is more than China, which is a communist authoritarian country four times our size. And I have worked on and introduced very sweeping criminal justice program that would not only end mass incarceration, it would deal in a very bold way with a broken and racist criminal justice system. Okay. What do we do? For a start, you're right. For a start, instead of putting so many people behind bars, our program invests in young people in terms of jobs and education, not building more jails and increasing incarceration. So what you got now is you got a lot of young people who are dropping out of school, who leave school without education, without job training. They have to make an income, have to create some income, and they do bad things, they end up in jail. Number two, when we talk about a racist criminal justice system, we understand the racism inherent in the so-called war on drugs. So you have a situation where, roughly speaking, the white community does marijuana at about the same level as the African-American community. And yet African-Americans are six times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than whites are. So what I have been saying for a number of years now, we have to end the so-called war on drugs. Four years ago, four years ago, that seemed like a radical idea when I was saying that here in Nevada. A lot has happened in four years, all right? We also have got to be thinking about, not more than thinking, about expunging the records of people who were arrested for selling a product which told you to go out and buy. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Right? We also, when we talk about criminal justice, we understand that Wealthy people do not end up in jail. Poor people do. I just want to, I can go on on this one for a long time. I won't. We got about eight seconds, Senator. I know. I'll give you a bit more than eight seconds because I want to make this point. Some of you are aware of the uh, trials now taking place against Purdue and Johnson and Johnson for selling opioids, opioids that they knew were addictive. And the companies are prepared to come up with billions of dollars in payment. Not enough, by the way, but they're prepared to come up with billions. But you have not heard any criminal indictments being made against these CEOs. Isn't that interesting? The crooks on Wall Street who destroyed this economy 11 years ago have paid tens of billions of dollars in fines. Any of them go to jail? That's called a criminal justice system, which is not only racist, but clearly if you are rich and you can surround yourself with all kinds of good lawyers, you don't go to jail. But if you're poor and you have an overworked public defender, you go to jail. So my goal is to significantly reduce the population of people who are incarcerated right now. Federal government does not control uh, state penitentiaries or local jails, but we will be a model in how we deal with the federal government. Last point I want to make on that issue, and I don't know if everybody here is aware of it. Right now in America, this is really quite unbelievable, we have 400,000 people in jail at this moment. They have been convicted of nothing. Why are they in jail? Cash bail. Okay. In other words, they were charged with a crime, they were arrested, not convicted, and they can't come up with the 500 or the $1,000 that they need to get out of jail. That is beyond obscene. That takes us back to the Charles Dickens era of Getty's prison. Right. So there is an enormous amount of work to be done. Now, you raised the issue of women, and obviously you're right. We are seeing more women in jail right now, and we have got to get you know, all I can tell you is that this current criminal justice system is totally corrupt, it is totally broken, and in every way we have got to reform it. I can go on and on about this issue, but it is dear to my heart.
and it is something I promise you as president we will address very, very aggressively. Thank you, Senator. So related to this piece about criminalization, mass incarceration, we want to focus a little bit specifically on immigration, which we had a little question on earlier. But over the last several years, we have witnessed unprecedented criminalization, detention, and deportation of immigrants. ICE and Customs and Border Protection, CBP, continue to operate with a virtual blank check despite broad public support for solutions beyond breaking up and locking up communities and families. As president, among the many things you could do to start tackling this issue, we'd like to know whether you will institute a moratorium on deportations, which is to temporarily stop deportations, and what is your message for people who are currently undocumented in this country? The answer to the first question is yes. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we have millions of people and children. I mean, it is, and I hope, I know the people in, in this room understand it. I don't know that everybody in America understands it. But if you are a child, I remember this, you know, um, one of your questioners talked about one of her parents, I think, facing deportation because of being stopped by a police officer in a car, is that right? And I remember listening to a young person, again, in California, who said, my father was in the car, my father was speeding, stopped by a cop, and suddenly everybody in the car heart stopped beating. And the police officer said, um, are you a legal Muslim? And his father lied. I said, yes. And then they were scared to death, and the police officer said, okay, have a nice day. But if the police officer had said something else, the family would have been totally disrupted. Right. So that is the kind of fear that exists among millions of people in this country. So we are going to end the ICE raids, which are terrorizing communities all across this country. We are going to impose a moratorium on deportations. And we are going to, as I mentioned, uh, and that's, you know, there's some things that a president can do with executive orders and something you can't. And you can't do what you can't do. But we can do what the American people want, and that is comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship, a path toward citizenship. And let me also say something, of which I have gotten into trouble, and people will criticize me for. I am, as some of you know, a supporter of a Medicare for all single payer system. And that means that everybody in the country has health care, including the undocumented. Okay. And mark my words, you'll see 30 second ads attacking me for that. And then you'll see another set of 30 second ads, because when I say I want to make public colleges and universities tuition free, that also includes the undocumented. Now I hope that as soon as possible, the undocumented will not be undocumented. All right, that's the goal, that we all have to deal with that. And again, I want to make this point. Please do not think that Trump's view of immigrants is what a majority of the American people believe. It is a view that some believe. It is not what most Americans believe. Most Americans believe the hard work and understand the hard work of the immigrant community who do some of the hardest work in this country, often getting underpaid, often not having, being exploited, by the way, because they don't have legal protections. I was some years ago, uh, I don't know if all of your questions have this one yet, but I went to a community called Immokalee, Florida. Does that mean anything to anybody? Yeah. You know what they do in Immokalee? They grow tomatoes, right? Mostly to undocumented people. And they were real ruthlessly exploited. They weren't getting paid adequately. The housing was atrocious. They had no legal protection. I went there and worked with some pro immigrant people, and we managed to raise the wages and get a little bit of dignity for those workers. So, uh, to answer your question, uh, this is an issue that is enormously important to me, and we will do everything we can to resolve it. Thank you. So we have about eight minutes left and two more questions. Oh. <laughs> um, turning to foreign policy, many Latinos living in the United States follow the politics of our home countries very closely. Our histories and our families connect us. 
Some Latinos are here because of the policies and politics of those countries. What are some of the most pressing threats in Latin America, and what would be your top priorities in your first term? That's a great question. It's an issue we don't talk about enough. So let me answer it in a couple of ways. For a start, for whatever reason, I don't, I don't fully understand it, the United States has largely, except in emergency situations, turned its back on Latin America. Right? You know, Latin America, uh, Mexico, Central America, are part of our hemisphere. So for a start, if we are going to deal with one of the crises that we now face, in terms of immigration. And that is that in countries like Guatemala and Honduras, El Salvador, mothers are prepared to take a dangerous journey of 1,500 miles with little babies fleeing violence and fleeing terrible poverty. You know, we gotta be thinking about why that is happening in those countries. And we gotta bring the hemisphere together. And I won't say on my first day, because I already I made enough promises what I'll do on my first day. Uh, but very early on, we're going to bring the hemisphere together to say, OK, what has to be done so that the people in Honduras and Guatemala can stay in their own countries and not live in the kind of poverty that they are living in? And this ties into another issue, and that is climate change. In Guatemala alone, hundreds of anybody here from Guatemala Hundreds of thousands of people have seen a significant decline in their already low standard of living because of climate change and their inability to grow the crops they need to feed their families. So as a hemisphere, we've got to come together not only to deal with immigration, not only to deal with poverty, but to deal with climate change. Third point, and that is all of you know that the history of the United States' relationship to Latin America has been, to say paternalistic, would be an understatement. All right, the so-called Monroe Doctrine. You're all familiar with the Monroe Doctrine. And what it said is, it's a great doctrine if you're in the United States, which says the United States has the right to intervene in any country around the world in Latin America. So back in, in the 1970s, the United States, Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, overthrew the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende because he was a threat to the corporate interest in this country. All right, overthrown governments in Brazil, overthrown governments in the Dominican Republic, supported terrible people in El Salvador, which resulted in God knows how many murders and deaths. So what we need is a foreign policy in which the United States respects the independence of countries in Latin America and in Mexico. We work together to improve the standard of living of all of our people. I voted against NAFTA, okay? And I did it not just to protect workers in the United States, but to protect family farmers in Mexico. And as a result of, Na of NAFTA and cheap corn coming into Mexico, many small farmers were making at least a subsistence living were driven off of their farms and then ended up trying to get into the United States. So the United States has got to not play a paternalistic role, not think it has the right to intervene whenever it wants to, but has to work with the countries of Latin America to help improve their standard of living. Well, llegamos a la última pregunta. We are now at the last question. See, I understood that, actually. <laughs> My Spanish is bad, but I did get that one. All right. I have an 11-month-old who's here, so I've been watching a lot of Dora the Explorer lately. <laughs> um, in your candidacy and throughout your career in politics, you've talked about the need for a political revolution. It is very clear that the Latinx community has a target on its back. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. our community does not have the necessary means or infrastructure to eliminate that threat. We believe that great campaigns don't just win things, they build movements and develop leaders that keep going. How does your campaign approach this? And how do you approach the development of new Latinx leaders and community organizing to continue the fight long after the election is over? Let me just congratulate you 
I've got more intelligent questions from you. In this discussion, and I think sometimes I get to the month. I don't know who wrote those questions, but they're very good. You're right. What I believe distinguishes my campaign, I know everybody in the Democratic primary process, and many of them are more kindly good friends of mine, and I'm not going to disparage anybody here. They're sincere and good people. But what makes our campaign somewhat unique is not just that I want to win the caucus here in Nevada, not just that I want to win the Democratic nomination, not just that I want to beat the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country, but what I have said over and over again, apropos to your question, is that no president, not Bernie Sanders or anybody else, can do it alone. And the reason for that is that we're not just taking on the Republican establishment and Donald Trump, not just taking on the Democratic establishment. I am taking on Wall Street. I'm taking on the insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry with the biggest bunch of crooks that you can imagine. We're taking on the fossil fuel industry. We're taking on the prison industrial complex. We're taking on the military industrial complex. Anybody think that one president, no matter how honest and well-intentioned, can do it alone? You can't have it. The history of politics in America and around the world is the only way that real change takes place is when millions of people at the grassroots level stand up and fight for justice. Economic justice, racial justice, social justice, environmental justice. So when you refer to my campaign as a campaign waging a political revolution, what it is about is bringing people together in the Latino community will play an enormously important role in that process, as will the African-American community, as will the Asian community. We need to bring people together around an agenda that works for all of us. You didn't ask me about raising the minimum wage, which we have got to do, which impacts all workers, primarily minority workers. Wasn't asked about equal pay for equal work so that women get 100% of the dollar, rather than, in the case of minority women, 60 cents on the dollar. Got to do that as well. So, so there's a lot to be done. I can't do it alone. I cannot. I would be lying to you if I said, vote for me, and I'm going to go to the White House, and I'm going to do it all. It doesn't happen that way. The people who own the country, the people who have the power, the people who own the media, they like the status quo. Why not? Massive increase in wealth for the top 1%. They're doing just great. What's not to like? But our job is to bring the bottom 99%. And that most definitely includes the Latino community. So I'm here today to ask for your support, not only here in Nevada, but to help us go forward together to transform this country and create a government and an economy that works for all of us, not just the 1%. Thank you so much for inviting me to this. Vegas and the organizers, look out for the next Ed Cheeseman from the Empire coming out soon. <laughs>